Thanks, Chris. Uh, welcome to CalSTRS. Uh, I believe uh, Mr. McCourt, if you're a familiar face, and I assume you're going to introduce your team. And just procedurally, uh, what we've been doing is we've been allowing committee members to ask questions throughout the presentation. So we may interrupt you. I may give you eye contact, letting you know that I need you to stop because I have a committee member that has a question to ask. So Mr. McCourt, would you introduce your team? Great. Uh, first of all, thank you. And we were advised of the um, reduced amount of time for the formal presentation. So we, uh, we will uh, limit the amount of time we speak uh, off of the presentation, hopefully have more time for questions and answers. I thought the most productive way to start is to have uh, each of us uh, introduce briefly ourselves. My name is Stephen McCourt. Uh, most of you have um, seen me before. We do do work for CalSTRS staff in a couple of different capacities. And um, I've been with Makita Investment Group for a little over 19 years. I uh, run our West Coast operations out of our office in San Diego. Uh, I consult for a variety of public and private sector pension plans. I'm involved in our investment policy committee that sets uh, firm-wide asset allocation policy, as well as our private markets uh, investment committee. My name is Frank Benham. I'm one of the managing principals at Makita, along with Steve. My day job is as the director of research, so that means I spend a lot of time looking at investment policy and asset allocation, and that's what I will be talking about later on. My name is Mika Malone. Uh, I'm one of the 15 owners at Makita Investment Group, and I work with five of our West Coast relationships, both in the public and private sector. I also sit on our defined contribution, general consulting, and ESG committees at Makita Investment Group. My name is Ed Omada. Uh, I co-head our public markets research group. Uh, I joined Makita a little over five years ago now, having spent the previous eight years working for Goldman Sachs in New York. Uh, I specific focus, specifically focus on non-U.S. equity managers within the public market space and also sit on our global macroeconomic working group. And I'll start with uh, a few words about our organization. Uh, before you do, before you do. I'm sorry to interrupt <laughs> Just you right away. Mr. Stephen. Mr. Otterman. Yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've done this to everybody at the beginning. And so. <laughs> he's you, done, you he's done, done this to everybody. everybody. <laughs> um, but it's, Lest you get settled in. Yeah, yeah so we, uh, you, you know our portfolio. We have a large commitment to global equity. A large part of it is uh, uh, basically index or uh, driven. Um, so two questions, you know, your point of view on that, your point of view on indexing versus active, uh, passive versus active management and uh, in the equity spaces that we're in. And then... Second, uh, your thoughts about diversification to other asset cal categories to diversify against uh, equity risk. What new, what areas do you think are appropriate for us? Um, and you know, how do you evaluate liquidity, lack thereof, cost, et cetera? Great. Uh, for the first two of those, I'm going to hand it over to Ed Omada to talk about our approach to um, the global equity markets. Uh, inactive versus uh, passive, and uh, I will take over the response um, regarding diversification away from equity risk. Sure. In the uh, in the global equity markets, well, I guess I'll sort of go through the different components of that, um, sort of one at a time. Um, in the U.S. large cap space, we do uh, have a preference for indexing, but I think it's important to note that when we say indexing, we're not talking about market cap weighted indexing. We're talking about um, some alternative beta type strategies, if you will, that we just believe are a more efficient way to allocate capital passively uh, to some of these asset classes. And we can certainly get into more details on what exactly we mean by that. Um, the non-US large cap space is, I guess, a little bit in the middle. It's a space that we think is, is increasingly uh, efficient, um, growing efficient over time. We do believe there is a small minority managers that can still add value in that space, but that number of, of managers is, is continually shrinking along with the, the, uh, the efficiency of the asset class as that grows. Um, and importantly, I think the, the small subset of managers that we do believe can add value in the space share some, some common characteristics. And um, it's some of the, the, the things we've highlighted actually on one of the pages in our presentation on page nine, which is 
talks about our, our approach to uh, manager selection within the context of concentrated portfolios. So we, we tend to prefer across all asset classes managers who uh, focus really just on their best and highest conviction ideas in their portfolios, aren't afraid to take active risk away from the benchmark, and that's something that's particularly important in an asset class like non-US large cap that is increasingly becoming efficient over time. Um, but again, this is, is something that we uh, very much apply across all asset classes. Uh, and then lastly, in, in the small cap space, in uh, obviously non-US small cap emerging markets, frontier markets, we still do believe that active management can add value. And in response to uh, diversifying away from um, equity risk in the, the global equity markets, um, uh, the, a, a couple of things I would highlight. Uh, first of all, and unfortunately, the very best diversifier against true equity risk today still is uh, duration risk, interest rate risk in your portfolio. Um, if there's a significant drawdown in the global equity markets, um, regardless of whether they emanate from problems in uh, China, the emerging world, or in Europe, or from the U.S., uh, the very strong likelihood is that, um, as of uh, today anyway, money will flow to the U.S. Treasury market and will bid up the prices of Treasury bonds, particularly those with longer durations. So. Um, uh, of course, the long-term expected returns of those bonds is lower today than it was uh, in most of the recent past. Um, but there is no substitute for duration risk as a way to manage downside risk in a pension plan. Of course, in the context of equity risk being the broadest um, and largest risk in most pension plans. We do think it's very important within the equity component of any plan to diversify across a lot of regions. Um, and I have up on the screen a, a chart that gives you a little bit of a sense of how we view about the ma view the major risks in the global economy. Um, today, we've been quite fortunate over the last three or four years in the United States to be the <clears throat> receiver of lots of capital globally as investors outside the U.S. have seen the U.S. as a safe harbor um, in the context of uh, deeper problems in Europe and, uh, and in China. Uh, but we think over the next 20 or 30 years, um, there are major risks in the global economy um, that even um, will make U.S. equity markets uh, quite volatile. And we believe you need to be diversified into uh, stocks from around the world, uh, particularly those in uh, the fastest growing uh, economies, to diversify away from many of the risks in the developed world. And I'll highlight uh, two of the most significant structural risks today, which exist in the U.S., uh, Western Europe, and Japan, and they are demographics and debt. Uh, the demographics uh, of those three major regions, which today represent um, you know, upwards of two-thirds of global GDP, um, nearly necessitate that GDP growth over the next couple of decades in those areas will be lower than what they've been in those regions post-World War II. Um, as a consequence, it's highly likely that corporate earnings growth and equity returns in those areas is likely to be lower as well. Uh, demographics is a hard thing to change, um, certainly over a period as short as 10 or 20 years. Uh, the other structural risk in those markets, uh, unfortunately, is the level of debt in both the private and the public sectors uh, in those markets, which uh, uh, means that all three of those areas will likely have to continue deleveraging um, both private and public sector balance sheets over an extended period of time. Typically, when deleveraging processes occur, um, that means capital is being used up that could otherwise be deployed um, productively in investment in new, um, new plants and projects and uh, other items that will enhance economic growth. So um, I want to highlight that even within the equity markets, we do think that diversifying outside the developed world is an important part of managing a pension plan over the next 20, 30, or 40 years. There's a correlation. As a, looking for non-correlated assets, um, again, where are you looking? And then how do you look? Are you, are you principally guided by historical correlation correlations or correlations in times of maximum stress? Uh, the correlations that matter most if you are concerned about risk management during periods of economic stress are the correlations during economic stress. And so uh, the, the 
if the the risk management process is focused on minimizing downside risk in a repeat of 2008 and 2009's financial crisis, then we would certainly want to look at the correlation that asset classes had during that time period, which, um, of course, was quite bifurcated. You had assets that went really, really down, um, and then you had U.S. Treasury bonds. And so to my first comment, in a crisis like that, we simply don't think there are great alternatives um, in the marketplace. Still today, uh, the best alternative to insure against the risk of a of a significant drawdown like 2008 is uh, is uh, U.S. Treasury um, bonds. But there's other risks to be cognizant of. These are longer term risks of being able to achieve a, a seven to eight percent return over the next 20 years. And um, I, th- I would argue that those risks are more important for most pension plans. While a short term drawdown is very painful for those that live through it, it's not necessarily consequential for a pension plan if the retur- if returns recover uh, the losses um, uh, that uh, that were had. Um, it's it's probably more concerning if U.S. equities only return three or four percent over the next twenty years, and not the assumed nine or ten percent that that most people are assuming. And so, for looking at diversifying into other types of equity markets or other types of credit. Uh, strategies. We also look at long-term correlations, um, which won't be at one. There, there will be a meaningful diversification benefit. Thank you. Very good answers. Uh, Mr. Rosaseal. Thank you. Um, so, if, if if you are you, you'd be our consultant, uh, the board's consultant, um, and we have a really excellent investment staff. And my question is kind of twofold. N- number one, what what is it that you're going to do for us that we wouldn't get anyway from relying on our investment staff? And second of all, what what questions should we be be asking our investment staff to answer? What are the, what are the issues that we should be asking them to focus on? Because maybe we don't know what those are, and so that's why we would hire you. So. You can give some ideas on that. Any one of the four of you. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask some others um, to to respond to that as well. But I think the biggest uh, the biggest reason that you engage one or more consultants to advise you as a board to supplement the work that your staff uh, is doing is both the additional resources that a consulting firm can bring to the investment challenges that you face. Uh, and also a diversity of thought. I think it's very helpful to see different points of view from uh, experts in the field that have experience advising funds that have similar challenges as you have. Um, And if I were in your position, um, I would want multiple points of view, uh, different ways of thinking about problems, and multiple potential solutions to choose from, not a single source of, uh, of possible uh, solution. So in the case of Makita Investment Group, as, as we'll, we'll go through, I'm sure, during the course of this presentation, um, we have uh, very large um, numbers of individuals that are focused on doing uh, real independent bottom-up research across every asset class that you invest in today or may choose to invest in in the future across every region of the world. And I think that's um, those types of resources can be quite helpful in supplementing the, the, the work that your investment staff does on your behalf. We also have a, um, a somewhat unique uh, sort of top-down structure in how we think about the world and think about asset allocation. And I think I'll hand it over to, to Frank to hit on a few items on asset allocation. Sure. The one primary question I would be asking your staff is, how are we going to hit our assumed target, I think it's 7.5%, over the next 20 years, given where we are right now with interest rates at 2.5%, you know, credit spreads, not much more than that, equities, arguably, certainly not cheap, perhaps expensive, how are we going to hit that target? And that's the question that, again, helps to have fresh ideas and fresh perspectives to evaluate that. Steve talked about a couple of possibilities. Uh, First and foremost, emerging markets, perhaps increasing your allocation there. Uh, 
but it's not just the growth story in emerging markets. With any asset class, valuations matter. Valuations are very important. And as it turns out right now, prices for emerging market stocks are much lower than they are for stocks in the U.S. So those are two, when you combine those two factors, maybe it means you weight more of your assets to non-U.S. stocks specifically, to emerging market stocks. You may also look at building out your real assets portfolio. Right now you have, I think it's 13% in real estate. You have a small allocation to what you call inflation-linked assets. Uh, perhaps that's another asset class that you looked about in terms of the diversification. And depending on how you structure it, you can get equity-like returns out of it. Uh, depending on whether you look at more oil and gas, or you're like talking about farming and timberland, uh, perhaps even more in infrastructure. Depending on how you structure it, you can seek to enhance the returns of your portfolio without adding significant volatility, and perhaps even reducing volatility of your assets. I'll, I'll just add one more, um, one more item in terms of uh, questions that you should be asking your your staff. In addition to, um, you know, how how best to achieve a seven and a half percent return in today's current market environment. Equally as importantly is how do we protect the fund from both short term and long term risks um, that we may face um, over very short time periods and a very long time periods, how to prepare for those. And I think as importantly, how do we define risk? Um, what we find is that um, there, there's many ways to, uh, to very productively mitigate risks in a pension program. Um, most risk mitigation plans fail ultimately because there's a difference of definition between the types of risks that trustees are most concerned with, staff and consultants are thinking about and most concerned with. So I, I would I would want to really get on the same page with my staff with respect to what are the true risks that I'm most concerned with. Is it the risk of a significant drawdown in a single year like 2008? Is it the risk of not achieving 7.5% on average over the next 20 years? Is it the risk of underperforming my peers? All of those can be addressed productively. They just can't all be addressed at the same time with the same solutions. And so I think that's part of the artwork of our, of our business, whether you're a staff or a consultant or a trustee, is figuring out precisely what you are trying to manage in the investment program, um, define that very precisely, and then uh, develop a strategy to, to address it. Walter, well, did you have another question? Yeah, let me just follow up on that. I, I, I mean, how, how do you go about doing that? What's, what is, what is the, the way that you help a, a board of non-investment professionals? I mean, we're not looking at, you know, correlations and beta. I mean, what are we, what are we looking at? How, what is that process? And, and, and how do you, as investment professionals who's, who speak the, and know all the, you know, the, the, the technical stuff, help us bridge the technical with the policy. Well, I, I think the um, the nice thing about the risk discussion is it, it shouldn't really be technical. Um, risk at the end of the day is sort of a very intuitive um, issue uh, for, for anyone. And the first step in addressing that is working with boards in uh, defining um, what sorts of risks the boards are truly concerned with and prioritizing those types of risks. So, so we go through presentations that um, ask you to be involved in a dialogue about what really concerns you on the inv in the investment program, what, what keeps you awake at night um, for fear of uh, of in some way failing to achieve your objective. And what hopefully is teased out of that is uh, a variety of concerns that, um, uh, that can be addressed in a very systematic way. And you know, those concerns can range from uh, the, the fear of a significant drawdown and a repeat of 2008, um, which I don't think is a technical uh, item. Um, they can range from, you know, not being in the top quartile versus other public funds, 
which is not a technical item. Uh, there's fears about not achieving a 7.5% return over short and long-term periods. Those are not technical items. And we can highlight both historically and prospectively the, the likelihood of the fund in its current structure um, uh, achieving objectives and not succumbing to those risks. Uh, and we can help the board develop strategies to reduce the likelihood of those risks occurring in the future. So we, we, we think dialogue is very important with the board. We think that going through the process very systematically uh, is important. And we found over 35 years in business in doing this that it's uh, defining risk is probably the most important part of our job because I think most firms and most investment staffs are very good at solving problems, but I think many fail in um, solving a problem that doesn't exist. And so I think the first the first thing you have to do as a as a board is to determine what is what are the major problems you're trying to solve, what are the major objectives that you have, and then work through solutions to that. Um, I actually really like that question because I think it's I as a you know as a board member I do struggle sometimes with understanding what consultants do for us sometimes because we do have a huge investment staff and, and so I think maybe if I can follow up on Paul's question and then ask another question and that is can you just can you talk a little bit more about the relationship though between you as an investment consultants with the investment staff and with us like in the next year, let's say we hire you. In the next year, what does it look like for you to communicate? I mean, the things that you're talking about with risk, Stephen, about, I think that's what a lot of people are talking about. It's certainly something that does keep me up at night. What What are the kinds of things, can you give us some examples of things you might do in the next year, Mika, whoever on the, you know, just fill it out a little bit. Because I know from my perspective, you know, I have to sit up here and make decisions for teachers in California and make sure they have a secure retirement. What are tangible things you're going to do with our staff and with us to help us make sure we mitigate risk in our fund? Sure. It's a great question. Um, the first thing that we do with any client relationship, and I think it's it would be key here, especially when you're integrating with the staff and especially, as you mentioned, a, a very significant investment staff that's involved in the day-to-day -day process that you go through, what we put together is what we call an initial fund review. And it's, it's not rocket science, but for us, it's a way of looking at every aspect of your portfolio from your asset allocation, your investment manager roster. So Steve and I, kind of as the general consultants focusing on a plan, leverage the resources of Ed and Frank on asset allocation, investment manager research. We leverage all of the other folks at Makita to look at every aspect of your portfolio and figure out what are your priorities as an investment committee, as a board? What are your staff's priorities? What are ongoing projects? What are things that they've been working through with you over the course of, say, the past year? What's important to Makita? What new information can we bring to the table to maybe redirect or enhance some of those pieces? And then we prioritize it all with you. So it usually comes forward in a couple of iterations. We put together a pretty bulky document that we bring to you and present and say, here's what we've found within your investment policy, your governance structure, your committee structure, your asset allocation, your investment manager roster. Here's where we think that we should go over the course of the next 12 months. And here's the order we think we should go there. That gives you as a board the opportunity to say, we love this, we, we don't think this is actually as important, or we actually addressed that with our staff nine months ago. We no longer need to look at emerging market equity managers, or we, you know, we've already made a decision to go another path. And w once we get that framework put together, it takes a meeting or two, then as a group, we can come forward with the most important items for you, whether that's doing specialized research, manager searches, asset liability studies, et cetera, it gives us kind of marching orders. And I think that that's where we work really directly with your staff. Again, they have the history. They've worked with you for many, many years. It allows us to ensure we have everyone's priorities in the same place. Because what we don't want to bring you is our best ideas about a topic that isn't relevant to you and your fund today. And so that's really kind of, so what you'd see from us is an initial fund review, followed by each of those items that are important to you, whether that's an asset liability study first, or maybe it's a manager search that's been out there, or looking at alternative beta sources, different types of indexing, et cetera. We kind of prioritize all of those and bring them forward. Have you had experiences where 
in other funds that you've worked for that you had a disagreement with what the staff is recommending to a board and that you've had to voice that in a board meeting or something like that? Or have you had examples of that? Or Yeah, I think that there are always, in any group of intelligent people, there's going to be disagreement. I think that what we really like to try to do is have those discussions while we're producing materials, make sure that you know we know uh, what we want to do, know what staff's input is. But it, at the end of the day, if we have a recommendation that we think is important and it may differ, we usually are very comfortable having that discussion in an open environment. I think that that makes everyone better. If there are challenges, um, we certainly don't try to you know, throw a, a fast pitch when, when that's not on the agenda for the meeting. And so we like to have those discussions both on an ongoing basis and then at the board level. I would say with most of my public fund clients I've worked with, we have a dialogue with staff every day. You know, there's, there's always questions that come up. We produce a report, they take a look, have some questions which then make it better by the time it gets to the board. Yeah, I, I would just add, I, I, th I think a certain level of, of, of uh, tension between the consultant or consultant or consultants and staff is is appropriate because Tamika's point um, you you want a level of of discourse that brings out the best thinking the best ideas and the best solutions and um, for yeah I'll I'll, I'll add that uh, while we work with a lot of uh, public funds that have um, large and uh, experienced investment staffs like yours. We also work with a lot of pension funds that have no investment staff at all. So, so culturally, we are um, we've evolved to be a consulting firm that is um, very used to providing um, our best ideas and proactive advice um, to boards, and um, uh, you know adapting that when there's uh, investment staff involved in the process as well. And it's worked, you know, very. Well, but our, our goal as consultant would not be to never bring a recommendation that isn't um, in agreement with staff. It would be our expectation that in collaboration with staff on a variety of issues, probably 90% of the time, uh, reasonable people will come to similar conclusions on what the best path forward is. But there will be 10% of times where there might be um, a, good reasons for a consultant and staff to disagree. And again, if I were a trustee, I'd want to I'd want to know that, and and I think that's um, that's productive ultimately. And then just a follow up question, um, you know, one of the things I'm actually proud of in the two years I've been on the board is is our investment policy and um, some of the structure that provides us as trustees. And I just wondered if you if any of the four of you want to comment on maybe some things that you think stand out in our investment policy, some things that you think are unique or strengths or maybe even weaknesses about our investment policy? Um, sure, I can start. Um, I think that looking through it, and, and we looked through it when we were providing our response to the RFP, it's a very detailed document and it has all of the main principles, I think, that you're looking for. And so from compared to a lot of clients that we come on board with that don't have a staff and that haven't put forward as many years maybe in producing a document, it's in very good shape. I think that with all of our clients, one of the key things that we look for and probably, you know, if we were asked to provide some comments on your investment policy specifically, there are certain cases where I think language and uh, goals can be streamlined to be a little bit simpler, a little bit more concise that allow you the same flexibility and decision making and process without getting bogged down in a lot of language. And so in a lot of cases, some of our recommendations end up being as much uh, from our history in academia, sort of, which is the origins of the firm, as much as they are investment specific related as far as the actual objectives of your policy. I think from, from the standpoint of your investment <coughs> goals and objectives, they're certainly consistent with the way generally speaking, that we look at the world and the markets. And so there's nothing inconsistent with Makita Investment Group's philosophy within your investment policies. Those are kind of my broad comments. The, um, the, the ESG component is, is fairly progressive. It's, it's better built out than most, um, and there aren't many, but most that do have them. I think yours is, um, is very thoughtful. On the asset allocation um, part of it, uh, alluding to what I, I said before, 
Um, there are certain areas that we would probably nudge you towards higher allocations and, and others we nudge you towards um, lower allocations for a variety of reasons. Um, but broadly, the allocations, I think, are, um, are appropriate to, uh, to achieve your goals over, over the long term. Um, as an organization, we, we do believe that uh, um, economic growth over the next generation or two will be driven uh, globally by what's going on in the emerging markets um, and the burgeoning middle class there. That doesn't mean that you need to um, double or triple your allocations, but you need to be cognizant of, uh, of where your allocations are um, on a regular basis uh, and take advantage where possible of, um, of the growth prospects uh, there. We also, as, as you know, we're very strong believers in the private markets, um, retail investors, which represent a very large fraction of um, overall U.S. investors. Um, have a very difficult time being able to access private market investments. And as a consequence, we do think that there's a liquidity premium built in for funds like yourselves to be able to allocate capital there. You have a very uh, productive allocation to private equity um, and to real estate. Uh, we would um, likely advise you to kind of nudge up the allocations to what today people refer to as real asset um, strategies, natural resource strategies, infrastructure, et cetera, as a way to um, uh, continue to elevate the risk-adjusted return of the of the portfolio. And the other thing we'd want to take a very close look at, we just don't have enough information to opine today, is is the bond allocation itself. Um, our our fear generally is that five years through a um, you know historically strong bull market, it's hard to think about this in those terms, but it really is. Um, investors are running away from bonds um, for fear of rising interest rates, which may or may not happen. Um, but in doing so, they are certainly, in our minds, elevating the, the level of potential risk in their portfolios. And um, uh, they're doing that either by lowering bond allocations or reducing durations in bond portfolios. So we, we'd want to take a very close look at that as well. Mr. McGuire. Uh, thank you. You're the last of four firms we're interviewing today. And you responded to basically a split scope of services, Schedule A of services and Schedule B. Uh, we may com combine them, only have one general <coughs> consultant. We may split those services. Obviously, uh, well, not surprisingly, the, uh, the incumbent saw some issues related to splitting the two services. The uh, other two uh, didn't necessarily see those same issues. But I'm asking all four firms the question as to um, your thoughts relative to the two separate schedules of services, whether it makes sense, and if so, why. And secondly, if you were going to be hired for only one of those schedules of services, which one would you prefer to be hired for and why? What value? Is it because you'd increase value? To, uh, based upon capabilities of your firm, or it's just a preference for some other reason? Great. Um, I think that in general, given the size of your organization and your investments, um, and also given to the points that Steve and I both made earlier about having a good dialogue and a challenge, I think that having two consultants can be as beneficial as having a consultant and a staff working together as far as getting different perspectives, even when their services are unique. And in this case, you've split kind of investment policy and manager searches from asset allocation. Um, and that piece of your services, you still have a kind of a core competency that you get out of a consulting firm where I think you would get some benefit from two firms potentially. Um, I think you could also have one. Obviously, all the consulting firms I think you've interviewed today have the capabilities of providing all of the sets of services, and we certainly believe that we could do that. I would say that if we had to select which category of services we think we could add the most value in, um, your category A services in, in policy development and investment manager recommendations, we think that resources that we have in the investment manager research area and Ed's team, et cetera, 
could add incremental value to your plan as far as finding those unique focused managers in both the public and private markets that, that may add value for you. And the category B services, I think that some of the ways we look at asset allocation are also very unique and we could add value above and beyond perhaps what you've looked at in the past as far as different ways of approaching asset allocation. So I think that we could add value in both. I would say that our capabilities in the category A services are probably stand out to me as a firm as far as what Makita Investment Group would bring to the table for you. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add that it's not unusual to have multiple um, consultants. Uh, increasingly, uh, even some of the smaller funds we work on have um, many consultants that they engage. And so every board uh, delineates responsibilities uh, differently. Uh, sometimes it's uh, between asset allocation and manager um, evaluation. I think that's a very logical uh, way to do it um, by asset class is another logical way to do it. We've been able to work with um, with groups uh, productively in, in both of those types of of arrangements. Uh, obviously, what's critical is a degree of uh, uh, coordination and a professional relationship between the two consulting firms that you engage and with staff. Since I would imagine the burden on um, determining sort of ongoing responsibilities of of consultants will fall on um, on staff to adjudicate at some at some level, but it's it's not unusual. It's something we're very comfortable with. Um, in many of our funds, we're one of many consultants that we work with, and uh, we work um, you know quite well with many consultants. Mr. Ackerman, yes. Um, this is also a question that everybody's been asked. So, um, <clears throat> if you can look back over the last, say, three years and take an example of some advice you gave, directional advice you gave one of your clients that really paid off. Uh, I'd like to hear about that. And then on the other side, uh, a piece of advice or a, a direction you sent a client off on that really just didn't work. And uh, what you learned there, that'd be helpful. If I can push the time frame back a bit further, if you don't mind, say 2008, 2009, thereafter. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's an easier one. But uh. well, well, I think everyone learned a lot more coming out of 2008, 2009. Sure. Um, in 2009, uh, early 2009, actually, when everyone was scared of equity markets having fallen so far and credit spreads widened so much, we did analysis, and particularly we looked at uh, high yield bonds and said, "Chief, where where yields are right now, you need a scenario worse than the Great Depression to justify this, justify the amount of defaults that the market is pricing in." We don't think that's realistic. We think our clients should increase their high yield bond allocation. Now, we are not traditionally tactical in our recommendations. We think it is very difficult to make tactical judgments. Uh, and those opportunities are few and far between. But when they do occur, it's usually based on valuations and valuations at extremes. And we felt that valuations were at extremes and high yield bonds at the beginning of 2009. Turns out we were right. Uh, so we did add value to our clients who made the allocation. Uh, my regret would be that we didn't tell them to back up the truck and really load up on high yield bonds at the time. Uh, but most people are dealing with constraints where they have target allocation ranges. So even if you went to the high end of your range, they were limited in what they can do. Uh, some other things we might learn from that scenario, you'd mentioned uh, illiquidity earlier. We designed a liquidity stress test for our clients. Many of our clients, many including you know, hopefully you, uh, you have about 25% right now in private market assets. You might have a question of, can we do more in illiquid assets in, in the hopes of getting high returns? Or alternatively, do we have too much in illiquid assets right now? Well, we designed that stress test to answer that very question. And that's the kind of thing that came out of 2008, 2009. Can our clients continue to meet their obligations without having to sell assets at distressed prices? And that's something that's built into our risk management and asset allocation process now. Do you have an example of something that really didn't work? Yeah, uh, the, I'll do uh, one that hasn't worked recently, but we continue to believe in it, and, um, and two others that were um, quite favorable. I uh, we've been 
you know, very large supporters as, of TIPS since the market um, was created in 1997, and many of our clients have dedicated allocations to them. Uh, they worked very well um, up until about May of this year when real rates um, started to spike. And um, we uh, believed and continue to believe that uh, both TIPS and I'll, I'll roll in commodities as another asset class designed to protect against inflation in a portfolio um, are areas that funds should strongly consider investment in uh, because we do believe that uh, you should be investing um, not just to um, maximize the apparent return in today's economic environment, which seems to favor U.S. equities over every other asset class, but to think creatively about what other economic environments are likely to occur over the next 20 or 30 years during the lifespan of this investment program. And we think there's some probability that inflation will um, will uh, be created over the next um, over the next 20 years. Of course, by the time it's created, all the assets that are designed to protect against it have already been bid up and you've lost your protection. So it's important to have um, some level of allocation to those tips and commodities or areas that we've advised clients to go into, those clients that um, went into those asset classes in the last um, 18 months or so have been uh, disappointed in the short term, but it's not something that we uh, think is uh, a mistake, but rather simply a... Um, uh, a, a necessary component of a, of a program designed to withstand a wide variety of economic environments that could that could affect pensions. Um, two other areas that have worked out very well are um, broadly the energy sector, um, mostly within um, the private markets. We were very early adopters in investments in uh, energy-related strategies of all sorts in the last five years. Those have produced returns of, um, in rough numbers, double sort of the average uh, private equity um, partnership. Um, that may not last um, forever, but it's an example of a sort of tactical opportunity we saw uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the other is frontier market strategies, which um, we began allocating client capital to three or four years ago. Same basic thesis as emerging markets, um, just a little more uh, amplified with the type of uh, countries that you're investing in. And um, uh, while it's early days on those investments, um, they've proven so far to, um, number one, have a correlation with other equity asset classes that's um, much lower than, um, than we had hoped even hoped. And uh, secondly, they are highly inefficient asset classes. So active management has been so far able to add quite a lot of value to them. And so um, that's another example of a kind of more recent um, action that we've taken with clients that's paid off. Thank you. Mr. Lawson. Uh, thank you. Um, one, of, one of the issues that is important uh, to me and other board members is uh, the diversity of the consultants that we um, hire. Uh, given the membership of this fund, uh, which obviously is highly diverse in the diversity of management on both the administrative and uh, investment side, uh, can you address um, the diversity of your fir firm as an organization, uh, the diversity of the team that would be uh, servicing this board, and uh, your commitment to diversity going forward? I can take that question. Um, as a firm, we're very committed to diversity. We proactively both advertise positions that we are looking to fill at Makita Investment Group on a wide variety of platforms, including some that target areas outside of some of the more traditional applicants that historically we had seen in the investment marketplace. Today, the firm, from a diversity perspective, we're 56% minority or female at Makita Investment Group. So. We've worked, that's increased by about 30% over the last five years, probably. So we have made good progress there. Um, as one of the female owners of the firm, it's obviously important to me. I also sit on our ESG committee, and it's something that we look at from both a governance and an HR perspective at Makita. Um, a third of our employees speak another language outside of English. So we speak about 20 languages in aggregate across the firm. And we think that for 111 people, that's a decent number. It's certainly not will never be perfect, but uh, but it's something that's important to us. And so we, we look for that diversity. Um, on the team that would service your account, you're obviously looking at some of those folks today. So Steve, myself, um, 
In our data reporting team that works out of our San Diego office, we have quite a bit of diversity. We have um, nationals from both Japan, Nigeria, and a variety of other sources. So although we haven't committed a specific resource to you, it's likely that um, some of those folks would not be necessarily um, born here in the United States. And, uh, and again, you know, as we look to, to add folks at Makita, I think that just like having a diversity of perspectives from whether it's where you went to school, where you grew up, you know, socioeconomic factors, et cetera, we look for folks from a variety of different backgrounds. And I think that we've done a relatively good job of, of hiring folks that represent kind of the broad client bases that we serve, which is across the United States, which is across income levels, which is across nationalities, which is across languages, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, I mean, importantly, the, what, what drives a lot of this, it's sort of drawing a connection to your question before about, you know, why have one or more consultants if you have an established staff already. Um, as, as a consulting firm that's in the business of developing investment solutions and uh, developing um, world views on capital markets, we want people involved in that process that come from as many diverse backgrounds in experiences as, as possible. So we find it incredibly useful to our process to, to have that. Thank you very much. Ms. Ortega. Thank you. Um, one of the questions in the RFP was about, uh, was asked you to um, list the top five clients by revenue. And so looking at the list in the, in the RFP, um, the size of the top five clients is small compared to STRS. But you have mentioned in your presentation your work with large public firms. So I'm wondering if that's been more on a special project basis rather than a general consultant. And if so, if you could talk a little bit about you know, what you might see as a, a, the challenges of working with a, an organization as large as STRS, um, as clearly would be your larger um, client. Yeah, yeah. We, we serve in a variety of roles for a variety of, um, of types of uh, plans uh, in the RFP where we list the highest, um, the largest clients by revenue. Um, those are uh, entirely, I think, private sector pension plans w that do not have any investment staff, and therefore the functionality of a consultant is much more intensive, and um, there are higher fees as a, as a consequence to that. Um, across the public fund space, we work with 26 public funds today, um, most of whom have some uh, investment staff. We're one of the three board consultants to uh, CalPERS. Uh, in that capacity, we advise them on uh, infrastructure uh, specifically. Um, we uh, advise the Washington State Investment Board. Um, we advise uh, the state of Arizona as well um, on both private equity and um, broader uh, general consulting asset allocation um, matters uh, from time to time. So the, the, the nature of the mandate just sort of changes depending on the particular uh, RFP and the particular services that a, that a fund is, is looking for at that moment in time. Um, but we do work you know, very productively in, in you know, that setting with large public pension plans. Any other questions from committee members? <laughs> Ms. Hendricks? Can I just, I just wanted to clarify on Ms. Ortega's question. So does that mean, have you been a general consultant for a public plan before? Or? Yeah, yeah. roughly, yeah, I'd say roughly 20 public funds we serve as general consultant for. You're in general investment. That's right, okay. yes. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, uh, you have five minutes to uh, close up your presentation and Great. you. Great. Um, well, I guess the, the best place to start is to simply thank you for allowing us the opportunity to present to you today. We're very excited about the opportunity uh, to work uh, with you uh, directly. Um, we find uh, uh, that in our business, um, we, we like to engage with clients that make us better, and we feel that this is uh, an engagement that um, will expand the types of uh, uh, issues that uh, we're forced to find solutions for, and I think that's a very um, uh, exciting prospect and um, fun for everyone involved. Um, we bring, I think, a lot of strengths uh, to you as a general consultant, um, uh, a very, very large research staff across every asset class um, that you 
invest in. Um, we bring to you, um, which we haven't had a chance to get into in depth, but uh, significant resources and uh, looking at global macroeconomic risks uh, that uh, will impact your and every pension plan um, across the country. And I think most importantly, we bring to you a 35-year history of operating as a firm with um, significant stability across our client base uh, and across our employees, uh, the people that you see in front of you today and hopefully we'll see um, monthly uh, going forward are people that have all been at Makita for a long period of time, um, most of whom have some level of ownership in the organization, and we think we run the business of consulting right, and that's a very important part of, of why, why we do this. So, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you.